You're live. We probably have nobody here. We're live. What's up, everyone? Welcome back. Welcome back. Sorry about that confusion. We had to dump you and get you back on again. Oh, okay. Um, so, my name is Garrett. Welcome back to Reach Out Reptiles. I appreciate you guys jumping in here. Rob, did you get notified again? I got notified again. Got two notifications. Hey, so what I was saying is, I don't know if you guys watched, but um, we had a great interview last week with Summer Stevenson from Summer Snakes. And that, that interview was awesome. The video is doing well. It was a lot of fun. And uh, one thing that we noticed is, you know, the first 24 hours on a YouTube video is critical. So for those of you guys that are fans, I would really appreciate a subscription and a notification so that you can watch videos as they come out. Brian Cusco, if you're on there, you know this. The first 24 hours of your, your video really defines what YouTube does with it next. We would love to have a little bit bigger pro, uh, platform for all the hard work we're doing so that we can get more people's questions answered. All right. So I think the, the thing to start with was, first of all, I owe you guys an apology. I said I would go live every Wednesday, and then I didn't go live last Wednesday. And the reason why it has something to do with this... Um, I know I've been working too hard or just getting chewed on by too many ticks or whatever the case may be, but last Thursday, before uh, before the Wednesday Live, so the previous Thursday, I was actually talking on the phone with Juliet Brewer and suddenly started feeling like I was talking funny. Well, half a... <laughs> hold on, hold on, we need to lighten the mood a little bit. I, just... I think I'm going to be... <laughs> oh, Rob is here. I <laughs> display you want to turn around can we see the uh yeah i want to see the uh arrow. Oh. no i don't want to see that i don't want to see that, man. See that. oh man, <laughs> oh, man. there we go get your get your gear shameless plug shameless. <laughs> Could you some words, man? shameless on uh, my part but i mean really rob is going above and beyond here guys i'm a good employee all right all right back to the sad story <laughs> So I'm talking on the phone. I'm just gonna stand in the background. Good. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Right there, huh? <laughs> That's not uncomfortable at all. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, for the record, Rob is no longer on the clock, so I don't know why he's here doing any of this kind of stuff. This is free. <laughs> free show. Six likes, and Rob keeps the pants on. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, it's like having me in the background there. Yeah, holy smokes. So yeah, if you guys can subscribe. <laughs> I said restart. <laughs> restart again. Oh my goodness. We gotta burn this one out of our memory. Jeez. <laughs> Ethan Brown says that's just frightening. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Rob, this was a beautiful strategy to take the attention away from my awkward eye patch and my ability to talk normally right now. I'm there for you, buddy. Thank you. If you need me. I, I'm I, here for you. I appreciate the shameless support. Lori Torini says we need to check the box on YouTube that says not for kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's just stretchy, man. You can't see it. <laughs> Lori, I think it was actually you that when uh, when we started doing four videos a week on this thing, you were like, hey, watch out. You know, take care of yourself. And that's what I, I think I wasn't doing. But basically... Um, this is Bell's palsy. This half of my face is paralyzed. I'm wearing the eye patch because I can't blink my eye, so my eyeball dries out. And just to show you guys how this works, like half of my tongue is numb, so I talk really funny. I can't close my mouth all the way. Like, look at this. If I go, ooh, ooh, try to make the ooh sound, my mouth is just messed up. I say, Ur. That's why I look like a pirate, you know, on the thing, because only this side of my face works at all. This side doesn't. Um, and yeah, Lori, I think, uh, I guess just pushing it too hard. So I did test positive for Lyme's disease, which uh, messes you up in all kinds of ways. Give me a, all kinds of fun brain fog and stuff like that. I'm um, getting treated for it. It's getting better. But I just want to let you guys know uh, why I missed that last week's live feed. And I don't know. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of weird not having half of your face work. But fortunately, nobody liked me for my face anyways. So we're going to go ahead and just <laughs> soldier on with this thing. This might take a while to clear up. Uh, I've got the, the uh, cool eye patch here that Jessica ordered for me. I think we're going to get, it's Halloween season, so I could probably get a really cool eye patch. Jerron wants to know why it's not branded. Oh. You need a little sticker. I can fix that right now. Yep. Here we go. Oh, 
Oh, we got it. Let's do this one. That one's too big. No, 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 no. This <laughs> one's. It's when you're talking about branding, it's never too big. Right, Is it gets stuck in your eyebrow hair? Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. How's that? There you go. All right, I gotta go out in the public. All right. See you later. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> So professional around here, guys. Duran, I hope you appreciate this. All right, see you later. See ya. We definitely need to wear longer shirts. <laughs> Just one. Just one. <laughs> Man, maybe you can get the kind with the tassels on the bottom. <laughs> For the record, I like tassels. All right, guys, let's let's get into it. Let's get into it here. All right, so what we do on these live feeds, we love having you guys here. This is an attempt for me to have like a little bit of a community with you guys. I always love going back and reading all your comments after we do the live feed. It's kind of impossible to respond to all of them. So what we do is we have a, a Patreon community. You can click the link in the description. I don't know if we have a description right now because uh, no. we just uploaded the thing, but we'll put that on afterwards or jump on any of our other videos. Click the link in the description. You can join our Patreon community. And our patrons uh, leave questions that they want for us to go ahead and handle this, uh, you know, to, to handle on these live feeds. We use that as a little bit of a temperature check for how everybody out there is doing what they want to do. Um, patrons, we're going to try to get through as many of your questions as we can this week. We grouped them into a couple of categories, so this video kind of makes sense. For the rest of you guys, if you got a question, you want to support the channel, you just got to know... Um, you can do a super chat and when jessica sees the super chat jump up she'll read that out for us we, we should have got one while rob was here i wanted to see him do the dance in the, <laughs> in pants. the pants the dance in the pants i don't know if you want to see that <laughs> yeah good point good point mm. but if you can throw a super chat down that really supports us helps us do this stuff here or if you're uh, on patreon there's a there's a chat on there you can ask these questions so what is our first Patreon question, Jess. Uh, let's start with Ryan Hood. He What's wanted, up, Ryan? Oops, where's my mouse? He wanted to know what you think some of the overlooked morphs might be. Oh, I think there's a lot of them. We might have to do a little bit of a snake room tour for that one. Overlooked morphs in reticulated pythons? Mm hmm This is something that I, I think everybody is going to have a difference of opinion on, but the way that I would see an overlooked morph is something that I think has like a lot of genetic potential, but not necessarily like a, a huge um, market value or or people chasing after it. So like probably some of my favorite morphs are the ones that most people would consider, you know, underrated. You know, things like albinos, those are, you know, rated, overrated. I don't know, depends on how much you like them. Stuff like the cows. Those are, are stunning. Motley Golden Child, beautiful, extreme. Everybody's going to like those. The underrated ones are like, um, well, like the anorithristic. You know, when when uh, I was working at Prehistoric Pets, they did several breedings. They made snows and they made platinum manneries um, before they had, you know, came up with that morph and, and proved out exactly what it was. It was actually Tim O'Reilly that named it. Because he was looking, he was saying, you know, these aren't, they're not azanthic, they're not lacking yellow, they still have some yellow, but there's a color shift, there's, there's no browns, there's no reds, so uh, he termed the, the phrase anarthristic. We first put that up, people didn't even believe it was a thing, they just said it was like locality influence, because it was stemming from dwarf and super dwarf bloodlines, um, and so people didn't believe it was there. You know, some people loved it, some people didn't, but it wasn't one of these more, it's, it's a subtle one. And it's really one that you can't appreciate in pictures because it has a depth to it. So I have been enthralled with it ever since then, especially in the development phases, having been there for that myself in the beginning. Um, I don't know that it's sentimental necessarily. Uh, it definitely is for me being coming from Dwarf and Super Dwarf just because I love them. But the fact that it was, um, that I got to see so many new and exciting combos coming out with the anarthristic. Let's go show them some other morphs that I think are, are really underrated. Um, so, let's see. A lot of times, people, you know, when, they, when the new morph comes in, it hits with a flash and a bang, everyone likes it, and then they don't like it anymore. And it, what was maybe once awesome can become underrated. 
before it gets, you know, fully developed. Uh, let's see. This is one that I think is uh, is a very underrated morph. This is a titanium. This is one of only a few Superdor titaniums out there. It was bred by Chris McVicker. I've made my own hats, and I got some of Chris's visuals. Let's take her outside over here. Um, just so that I can breed his bloodline into my own and kind of refine it over time. This is a, a very kind of typical. You can see why it would be underrated as a titanium. It's not super flashy. It doesn't have extreme pattern or any of that. Um, but it's just a, a really pleasing kind of a metallic chrome on the back. And this girl, now that she's getting a little bit older, her colors are starting to come in the sides. And it's just a just some really nice, pleasing color tones. And even though this one is not the most spectacular, she's getting a pretty cool yellow head, too. Look at that. The nice stripe. The, one of the things I like about titaniums is, is uh, they're extremely variable, especially in combos. So the way titanium works is it's basically a partially patternless gene, but it erases different parts of the pattern on every snake. So you can see with this girl, I, I like the kind of like lower expression titaniums that leave a lot of the pattern and they just kind of tweak it. Um, this is not what I would consider a lower expression, but you can see how she has some side rosettes there. Sometimes they have a big white stripe bordered in black. Sometimes the top is like super dark metallic. Sometimes you get bleed through from the sides and the top. This is just kind of a traditional, nice, clean, other than the rosettes. Um, titanium, she does have a nice head stripe there. But this is a morph that, um, you know, prehistoric pets developed it and put it into a bunch of, of morphs and genes and stuff like that over time. But there's a lot more to be done with it. Because it is a pattern mutation, I think the best place to start is color mutations. I remember seeing the first purple titanium and it was amazing we've seen mochino titaniums now sometimes the other pattern you know two patterns read together have less than spe spectacular results like I, i'm not the biggest fan of like a motley titanium although the super motley's turned out really cool um but there's a lot of development to be done with it uh and when i say development too for me what's more exciting about a morph is the bloodlines behind the animals you're working with because you can take a very simple morph and run it through multiple different bloodlines and find all kinds of really unique expressions. So let me show you an example of what I mean here. So one morph that I think everybody is familiar with is the tiger. It was the first incomplete dominant mutation, you know, super popular. We were talking about Annery as well. Um, you've seen a lot of tigers. A lot of them are very kind of humdrum tigers this is not a humdrum tiger this is a ridiculously spectacular anti tiger let me show you how bad the lighting is follow me over here one of these days jess we need to get the good lighting where the snakes <laughs> actually are but yeah this is an anti tiger and i'm sorry everybody she sold i posted her on facebook the other day and somebody called me up and snatched her up but what makes this animal so cool like these giant rosettes that bleed down and seeing all the the really funky, wacky pattern that this tiger has. <laughs> What's up, Chris? You can't have her. Thank you for the two dollars, but it's, it's not buying her. <laughs> like, thanks, no. Do it. Let's make her do the dance. Is that cruel? <laughs> nah, she likes it. We we love these. She looks like she animals. has Lombardi trophies on her side. Lombardi trophies. Doesn't she? That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Look at that. The Lombardi trophy snake. <laughs> so what I think makes this girl cool is the large amount of super dwarf, you know, uh, chaotic and clean pattern. So she's 50% Kalatoa, which gives you this black dorsal stripe, pulls everything to the top. And then she's also 25% Madu. Now, Madus are very light. They're very bright. They're super clean. And just having that little bit of Madu super dwarf influence changes this dramatically. If you were able to get a high percentage Madu Tiger, I think it would look completely different from anything else you've ever seen. And I know this is the case because we actually got a clutch from, uh, we bred, when I say we, I, I worked with Andrew Acevedo. He had a 50% Jamp Tiger. Jamps are beautiful and clean too. And I uh, lent him a pure Madu male to breed with his Jamp Tiger. 
So we have, this is 25% Madhu. We have a 50% Madhu. Oh, some of these words are hard. 50% Madhu uh, Tiger over here. Let me show you. Again, Anery Tiger with a little Madhu. And that's really nice. But what, were you, what would you do if you took out all the chaotic and dirty Kalatoa influence and only had the cleanest and the nicest, which is Jamp and Madhu, right? And you just made a simple Tiger. This is what, this is what happened. Chris Gear with another super chat. <laughs> you can't have this one either, Chris. <laughs> this one's mine. This is from a pure Madu male to a Jamp Tiger. What the heck is going on with that snake? So again, folks, this is a tiger. Just a tiger. But the Jamps, I've always said, Jamps are the secret ingredient to making beautiful clean animals when i say clean i mean very little see these speckles in here there's only a few scales on the thing's whole body but most of it looks like this it looks like you drew it with a, a fine point pen look at this she curls up like that it looks like the burger king crown so this is just a tiger so you know i i don't know that i would say tiger is an underrated morph it's just kind of like run its course and it's common now i guess the thing that's more underrated than anything else that's even out there is is working with good bloodlines you know finding the animals that you want to use the madu father of this girl i chased for two years and i had to spend an obscene amount of money just because the guy who was selling it was like oh garrett hartle wants it oh i'm gonna charge extra so uh it was one of the most expensive pure locality well it was i think it was the most expensive pure locality animal i ever purchased was the madu father of this snake and Pure Madus is very high on our to-do list. In fact, the only reason why this girl exists is because Andrew had a Pure Madu female that I sent over there for him to breed with. And uh, he maybe snuck it in the cage next door. But look at that. So biggest underrated animal of all is going to be, you know, nothing to do with morphs, but just good selective bread, Somebody you know, and, and vision. Somebody asked where snakes are posted for sale. Uh, we don't post them for sale. Send us a, an email and, and we'll let you know. We have about 150 in stock right now. But they're not really like a commodity to us. So they're also Superdors are like a horrible thing to buy off a list. Because I say these numbers and things and, and people like to imagine they can know what that animal will end up as. But if you buy something listed as like say a dwarf tiger, you could end up with something that gets 6 feet or 16 feet or anything in between. So buying these kinds of animals, like the, the, the bloodline selectively bred animals off of a price list is really not the way to go. I think what you want to do is find the correct breeder and then tell them what you need, have them work with you to get an animal. So that's why we sell all of our animals, Ooh, guys. Super chat. Woohoo! Who's that? Who's the super chat from? Uh, I think I'm not going to look. I can't oh. see it on here. Yeah, I'm up here. Oh, Marshall, what's up? Yeah, he's got his uh, he's got his snake coming out soon, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. So that would be an underappreciated one. Um, the other thing is sometimes uh, it just hey girl, come back in there. Um, oh, she's like whoa, 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 wrong cage. I only have one eye, so it's harder to read. Apparently, I'm we do all my reading with my right eye. Um, so one of the things that uh, that really does it is is these these bloodlines that you throw together and then as they're developed you know you'll see some morphs that are very underrated become you know much more highly rated later on this is another example i think annery sunfire is a great combo this is one of those crispy cream clutch so the pattern has something else going on but well we have to take it in this room come on guys these are like <laughs> awesome chokey animals you don't want to see them in crappy lighting look at the difference Look at the colors on this thing. It's like a metallic emerald. Oh, Sunfire and Annery just go so well together. That's a really cool one. Annery also seems to like pull pattern back onto things, which maybe is why some of the super doors are so chaotic. I'll show you what I mean. You guys know what a golden child tiger looks like. Golden childs are basically patternless. They have some speckles. And when you get a tiger golden child, all the spikes just become one thin stripe. 
Weirdly enough. You got two more super chats. Nobody. Oh my goodness. All right, hold on. I'm going to do two dances at once. Who are they from? Uh, let me click. <laughs> you got to go back. Here we go. <laughs> we dance with our snakes here. It's a part of socialization. If you can dance with them and they don't do anything, we do really good. The jeweler guy. What's up, man? Thank Chris you. Chris said another one. I think you skipped Chris's earlier, too. I got Martian here. Chris? No, I didn't. He said, uh, can I lend, lend you a Madu to raise and adore? I don't have any babies to raise yet. We're trying. Um, the jeweler guy, yeah. It is a bummer about the Bell's Palsy. We'll figure it out. <sighs> we'll work it out. Like I said, nobody really cares that my face works out well anyways. That's not what pays the bills around here, so we're all right. But, uh, yeah, and thank you for the pirate compliment. Wait till I get my next eye patch. I got it off Etsy. They have a lot of options right now during Halloween. <laughs> uh, Chris, this is that was not the one you were almost able to get. Um, that was one that I was holding back from the beginning. But, yes, same clutch. Okay, so I wanted to show you this. This was just another cool thing about Annery. Uh, this is a golden child tiger. And if you look at her pattern, I don't know how well. Can you give me a top down on this one, Jess? Mm -hmm. Look at how thick this black line is. And she almost comes out looking like a tri-stripe. There's two side lines on there, too. Can you guys see that? So this animal has a lot of Kalatoa and Jampea influence. But the anery is like pulling the pattern back in. It's got tons of rosettes. If, if something was going to be underrated, this is a very underrated combo. I think people, this clutch had some Motley Golden Childs in it. Everyone goes, oh my gosh, I need a Motley Golden Child. But Annery Golden Child Tiger, oh my goodness. Look at this girl, you guys. Look at how clean that head is. The tiger brightens a lot of stuff up. So she's got the most gorgeous silver eyes that just look like she's wearing mascara. Just as iridescent as any Motley Golden Child you've ever seen. And being this like gunmetal gray with that thick black dorsal. I just think that is so cool. It's like taking a patternless snake and forcing all the pattern back on. And then to see where it ends up is super cool. So that's a cool one. And then I have a little history lesson for you on this question with that girl. I'm just going to put her away. You, you can say hi to them, Jess. You don't have to follow me everywhere. You can just flip the camera around on yourself. Didn't she make such a great, like, Vanna White in the... Which we're really trying to get Jess in the videos more. But she won't do it. Why not, Jess? Because you're the star of the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> the pirate show. We are the pirates who don't do anything. Rob already tried Just to steal your thunder. To lie around. <laughs> this is a morph that I think is a great example of something that was underrated and is now appropriately, appropriately rated. When these first came in, there was several being imported, and so they were cheap to buy because they were first bred in Indonesia and in Germany. Um, and so it was really, you know, a lot of importers just kind of, you know, I don't know, they had this new morph. They This is a marble, and they sent them over, and they were coming over. The first marbles were like $400 when they were a brand new incomplete dominant morph. It was crazy. Can you guys see the way that the marble breaks up the pattern and especially um, pushes like the golds and silvers into really weird places? I know it's a little difficult to see on a baby, but this is a really nice example of a of a of just a normal marble. And so, yeah, they came in really cheap. A lot of people with the first marbles, maybe they were, you know, not selectively bred into the right bloodlines like this one is um but people were like i don't know it looks kind of like a head anthrax but it doesn't make anthrax so why would i care about it or people always compare one morph to another and obviously a head anthrax and a marble are completely different things that work totally differently into projects so it's definitely worth having multiples of that kind of thing um so that you can really develop the stuff but marbles are now quite expensive and um, the, you know, the first uh, Super Dwarf marbles I sold about three years ago were like 3500 bucks, And their father was imported for like $400. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Are we going to do another question? I suppose we can do another question. <laughs> I like that question. That's a good question yeah. about underrated morphs. Yeah. 
Well, we're still on morphs because Joshua Sampson wants to know if you have any plans on creating morphs with Karampa blood. Yeah, so Joshua, here's the way that it goes. Um, I personally would not be very comfortable using a pure Karampa female to ever make anything but Karampas because I don't know if you guys realize it or not, but like legitimate ones, there are people who bought a bunch of Subadors and started picking out which ones were Karampas and stuff, but oh my gosh, you can't do that kind of stuff. You know, um, so like legitimate Karampas that we know of in the United States, there's three females, two of them are here, and that's it. Um, they were only bred for the first time this year, so I would hate to breed them into morphs. Now, one kind of neat thing is that uh, our second clutch of Karampas did produce anneries, so there is a naturally occurring morph within the Madu population that, that we were able to uh, prove out our adults and make some anery Karampas that as absolute cures. Now, that doesn't say anything about the males. Um, we only sold a couple pairs of pure Karampas for this year. Uh, we didn't get that many babies to start with. And it's probably going to be the same thing if we can get more. It's just going to be maybe a pair here and there trickled out just to really spread the bloodlines around. But when we get extra males... I like to make sure I know where they're going so I can kind of keep tabs on all the bloodlines. That's how I got a lot of the stuff I have anyways. It's just by following spectacular animals and swooping them in when they became available, like that Madu male I was talking about. Um, but the captive bred uh, Karampa males, I don't really have an issue breeding those into stuff to bring some of the Karampa influence. Now, you're not going to, you know, go to the ultimate extreme size because Karampas are the smallest Superdorf locality using a male, but I don't think that that matters. If you're taking something like this girl, uh, this is actually would be a perfect project for it. Um, she, this one's 25 Kalatoa, 25 Jampea, and she's just really chaotic, good marbling through her, and the Karampas have a very chaotic pattern as well. Especially in the way that with the Karampa locality, you'll see the black portions of pattern get thick and thin randomly, especially towards the tail. It's a really cool trait that that locality has. And so I think that would be really, really awesome looking in a marble. So once we get girls like this grown up, they're already good small bloodlines. Bringing that influence in to make like the Karampa marble version of what that Madu tiger girl was I showed you earlier would be a fantastic project. And I'm not the only one working on it. Um, the, the first clutch of Karampa is hatched in January of this year. So it's just about... in with the super chat. <laughs> That's all you get. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the first um, Karampas are, are coming up on a year old, and there are males out there in collections. So those breeders that have males with no females, they're captive bred. You know, you're not using a wild-caught animal to, to produce your crosses and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd say there's a pretty good chance you're going to start seeing Karampa crosses popping up, at least from the male side. <laughs> Rob said that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rob, get your uh, stretchy pants back over here and show us how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tristan. I appreciate your support. So what did Tristan say? He wants to know if he can have it. <laughs> this marble? No, you can't have this marble. Tristan's been wanting marble for a long time. Yeah. This is a super nice marble, Tristan. I need it super is. nice ones so I can make nice ones for people like you. You got to let me develop the bloodlines so that they exist before you buy them. I snatched this up. Um, actually, I'll, I'll pitch a, a buddy, but Andrew Acevedo sold me this. If you want a dwarf uh, super dwarf cross marble, you can go talk to him. He might have something for you. That was a nice one. I, I took the bloodline just, just because she's beautiful. And, um, you know, similar to the Chris McVicker titanium. Boy, when I see people out there doing good stuff, I, I buy into it. And then I refine it myself later. But that's because we have a lot of options for doing that kind of stuff. So give me some time. Let me refine the marbles down and I'll make some really killer ones. It's definitely one of my favorite forms. Uh, Josh also wanted to know, what's your thoughts on hybrids like bad eaters? Hybrids like bad eaters. What do you guys think? What do you think about high? So a bad eater is a Burmese reticulated python cross. Give me a comment. Let's get this conversation started. 
What do they say in there? Yay or nay? Thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you guys think? <laughs> Rob loves them. <laughs> Rob wants them. Rob is secretly... We don't ever tell secrets on like live videos around here. We don't <laughs> bury little Easter eggs everywhere. Rob is Chris secretly working on chat. some bad eater projects at home. What's up? Chris is super chat not a fan. <laughs> that is commitment. Thank you, Chris. My uh my line. I have not a fan, not a fan, not a fan. Things are not good. Lots of not a fans or just crits? No, that's that's some more people. (laughs) All right. Let me give you my personal viewpoint on this, okay? Um there's a lot of people out there that have a lot of opinions on the way things can be bred. I just told you one myself. I said I would not breed a pure Karampa female to a more, you know, especially my wild caught girls because they're just too valuable from a conservation uh, standpoint. Not not like I, I would love if my animals could someday go back to the, to the wild. I don't think that's the way that conservation projects should be done. Uh, I don't know that it's even realistic. But just to preserve something for future generations that they may not ever be able to see because the animals are common, right? So there's that kind of a preservation. However, I said I would go ahead and breed a male Karampa into something like a marble that may have started from mainland origins. The funny thing is, every different snake species has different background history. Like in the boa community, the, the locality crosses and Hybrids and things have been a big no-no for a long time. With reticulated pythons, nobody cared in the beginning because it wasn't making crosses or hybrids within reticulated pythons. They were all one species, and until they separated out the dwarf and superdwarf as their own stuff, um, you know, making, say, a superdwarf tiger was not doing any kind of a cross. Now they split it and they say that it was. Um, when you go to hybrids of different species, I think there are some classy ways of doing it. It's definitely like a freak science project, but let's be honest, any of the morph crosses that we do are freak science projects. Even if you selectively breed your animals just to make nicer ones, you're manipulating that DNA for something that makes them more pleasing to captivity. So... If I can make something like a cow retic that looks completely unnatural uh, and yet is the kind of animal that nobody could be afraid of because it's got these beautiful blue eyes and this pink and white skin and, you know, um, they just, they look like a plush toy or something like that, then use an animal like that to teach people about snakes, awesome, you know. I don't think that there's ever any kind of huge threat to the industry from bat eaters being bred into everything because they're not easy to make. It's, it, you can try, I know people that have tried for decades and never been able to make them. And some of the most extreme hybrids, like a berm ball, for example, was made on accident by someone putting their bermies and their ball python together while they were cleaning cages. And they accidentally had a clutch. So, um, so here's my take on it. If you take two species that are very close together, Let's say a Timor python and a reticulated python. I love Timors. I love retics. You mix them together, and people have done that. My personal preference is kind of like, eh, you know, like you, you're, you're going outside of a species to bring in bloodline that's really not that different in the first place. You know, uh, another example would be something like a, you know, a, a corn snake and a yellow rat snake. With the super or chat. Rob. <laughs> okay, here this one's for you, Rob. <laughs> How about a little bit of this too? The Rob dance. Like that? Is that what you do? <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, so if you're doing something that is not that close, but it's it's further out there, you know, and you're doing something like a Burmese to a retic, I think that the bad eaters can be cool. A lot of hybrids don't look as good as either parent species. But I think it would be kind of neat to take something like, let's say, oh, I don't know, a Mochino retic or a Marble retic and breed it into the Burmese pythons, 
you know, what if you did a marble retick to a hypogranite Burmese or something and then tried to bring those recessives back out the next generation? That stuff can be pretty neat. Uh, it doesn't seem to have any, you know, issue with the babies um, as far as like bad eaters not being healthy. They're, they're healthy. They're fine. This is not something that um, is, is going to mess up, you know, animals in the wild or kind of like the colony of these kinds of animals. It's just for the pet trade. So I don't see any difference between doing something like a beautiful cow that gets people interested or a beautiful bad eater that gets people interested. I think there are less classy ways to do it. Like if you bred a black blood python to a red blood python, that's kind of like, eh, gross. You know, especially because they're close and they can be they can be confused with each other in later generations and unscrupulous sellers and things misrepresenting them. You have those kinds of issues. But if you're doing a blood python to a carpet python and making something completely wild and new and you're able to do that, I don't have any issue with it. I, I know that even a lot of people who do have issues with it, if I say, hey, I have a picture of a secret project, I bred a blood python to a carpet python, you want to see what they look like? Even people that hate hybrids will be like, yeah, I'll take a look. <laughs> so if your curiosity is peaked that much and you're a cynic, Aiden, why not? Super chat. Aiden super chatted. He Crowley. Called it early. He wants to see Crowley. <laughs> Apparently FaceTiming him wasn't enough. Wow. He FaceTimed his snake early. <laughs> Aiden, Aiden FaceTimes his snake. Aiden's in California, and he's super chatting so he can see Crowley. That's my take on hybrids. If you're doing like a berm ball or something crazy like that, and it's a widespread, and you're making a, a weird new race of snakes that didn't exist before, it's very similar to making morphs or any of the superdorf crosses that I do. But I think you need to separate the crosses from the pures, not ride those fine lines. Like, like I think saying, oh, it's pure Jampayanis, or breeding a Jamp to a, to a Kalatoa just as pures. It's kind of, yeah, and then super calling them all superdors. That's a little bit gross, you know. Um, and not that I don't like those animals, but just, like, don't call it a pure. It's not a pure anything, you know. It's in between. So, super chat. Who's this one? Uh, Janet Jan, interesting conversation. How different would you go? Woohoo! <laughs> Janet. Janet, I want to see a live bearer bred to an egg layer. That's what I want to see. If go that was going to happen, how talk. would it happen? I don't even know. There was a rumor once of a Brazilian rainbow boa being bred to a California king snake. I think it was bull crap. But if it could happen, that would be weird. How different would I go? I don't have any morality issues with going extremely different. What if you bred, um, like I would love to see a giant retic bred into the world's biggest blood python, one of my old blood python, Danielle, just to make something that like eats Rottweilers or something. Maybe that's not politically correct. But how cool would it be to, if you could get a blood python with those proportions to be even just 14 feet, that thing would be a monster. Um, a scrub and a retic would be cool. Or what about a scrub and a green tree? Something super crazy and arboreal and insane. Uh, no, those are actually the wider spreads are the ones that I think are the most interesting projects to get into. There's not really any limit on how far I would go. And I love that science defined... I, I like when science is wrong. <laughs> I don't know why. But um, like a long time ago, they said hybrids were not viable between a genus. And then they'll do things like a Burmese to a retic, which are currently not in the same genus, but they produce viable offspring, fertile offspring even. You can breed bad eaters into multiple generations. Aiden, here's Crowley. He's in shed. This is the very uh, rated or overrated, depending on how you look at it, Motley Golden Child. They are beautiful. Aiden, uh, Crowley is looking more and more like, I don't know if he's an anery or not. He looks anery right now. But we shall see. We'll hang with him here so you can watch him a little bit because he's super chatted. So, Aiden, this is Crowley. He's, uh, eight, or everybody, this is Aiden Snake Crowley. Aiden, is he? he uh, he's coming up on two years old, right? He's like, he's older than a year and a half, a little less than two. This is one of our 25 Kalatoa, 25 Jam. Mad scientist projects. So I really don't see the difference between a, a cool snake like this and a bad eater. He says he always looks anery. Yeah, that's true. 
you know, um, I think if we're manipulating anything from nature, why? I don't know that why we would be afraid to do that during like the domestication of a species. That's kind of how they all happen, you know, um, just by breeding out and, and pulling new genetic things in to create a visionary snake. It's a fun process and it doesn't hurt anybody and it doesn't hurt the animals. So I don't know why there's any morality. When you do the real close crosses, they can hurt bloodlines and animals or if you work with really rare stuff like uh so like the worst hybrids in my opinion would be like a bolens python to a carpet python that's like nasty because bolens are so rare you know really hard to breed everybody's working on trying to, to breed those and and do stuff like that and then a carpet python's really close but also really common and, and super mixed up as well so that kind of stuff i i don't really like at all that's just a personal preference though from a morality standpoint um, I think as long as you're not jeopardizing the survival of, of a race, like a Karampa, just so you can make some weird looking small snake, uh, it, you, to jeopardize a, a naturally occurring race just to do that with something so rare, I think would be morally wrong. Outside of that, I, I don't think there's any morality, I have no morality issues with it. What do you think? There's just classy and less classy ways to do it. I say if you're going to do it, go big. You know, or just don't even try. Uh, so Ryan Hood wanted to know what are some pros mm. and cons of selling at reptile shows? Reptile shows. Um, ah, Crowley can hang with us for a while. Okay. I just don't want him to beat up his skin. So Ryan, one thing I never understood is a customer and be like, hey, are you going to Tinley next month? How about I buy my snake from you here? Will you will you deliver it to Tinley from me, for me? Now, us, with almost all of the animals, if you send us our, our payment on friends and family, our policy is we do free shipping for friends and family. So if you use the friends and family service on PayPal, we'll ship your animal to you for free. It leaves here. We just shipped a couple today, Jess. Mm -hmm. And we expect them to be there in the morning. If I go to Tinley... I got to pack them up. I got to drive out there Thursday. We set up on Friday. They're there all day Saturday. You pick them up on Sunday. You drive home. So it's like five days these suckers are on the road, and Tinley's a close show. I would not want an animal that I had to be on the road for five days. The other thing about a reptile show is you're going to have people there with mites. You're going to have people there with nidovirus. You're going to have people there with IBD. You're going to have people there with coronavirus. I don't know. You're going to have all kinds of um, cross-contamination with the animals. I'll give you a perfect for, uh, for instance. I like to take care of my animals while they're at the reptile show. I don't just stick them in deli cups and leave them there. So all the babies I pull out in my reptile booth, I built myself, and it has snake racks locked up in the bottom of it. So I move them down there, and they have heat tape and water bowls and hides just like they do back here at home. So they go out, they do a hard day being on display, but then at least they have water, hides, all that kind of stuff. The animals that are, are bigger animals that are in displays have heat lamps that are up on top, kind of like these ones right here. Uh, we have these Zilla style dome lamps, and they're amazing because they're really small, slim design, but they put out a lot of heat. So I use those at the reptile shows. You know what, he has a big meal in his belly. Look at yeah. that, he should probably, should probably should put him away. <laughs> So, um, just because he's got that big old meal and he's in shed. and Well, there you go, Aiden. Thank you for the support, buddy. <laughs> um, so, what happened was I, I was next to a vendor who had all kinds of random animals. He had, like, lichianus and monkey tail skinks and, uh, it, like, igua green iguanas and stuff like that, chameleons, all over his booth. And his animals were just sitting in deli cups. It was kind of, like... The guy was obviously a flipper. These are not animals that he's breeding or trying to work with to promote. He's just buying animals and selling them. That's Those are kind of like the, you know, tendency to have like the most issues at a reptile show. About five of his animals escaped that night. They had no heat. It was a cold show. It's Chicago in March. They all came to my booth, which was next door, and were sitting next to my heat lamps, keeping my animals warm. And so me taking care of my animals turned into a bunch of like 
gross flippers, reptiles, and stuff with whatever diseases they have hanging out on the screen cages of my personal holdbacks. Not the ones I was selling, but the ones I was showing off. So now I got to quarantine all these animals and stuff like that. So a reptile show, if you know what you're going to get, go to a breeder, buy it direct, have them ship it to you. Even if they're charging you shipping, it's worth it because it goes straight from their collection to yours. Our animals have never been healthier when it comes to things like mites and stuff like that. Um, I'm not afraid to talk about those. They, they're they like fleas with dogs. Sometimes you get them, especially if you go play with other dogs and stuff. We treat well. We take care of that kind of stuff in our collection. And when we go to reptile shows, we have to quarantine all this stuff and, and take care of that to make sure that we're not getting those back. But, you know, with no shows going on for coronavirus, the animals have not had any of that kind of stuff whatsoever. We still run our regular tests that we do. Like one thing I monitor is... Um, Nidal virus, we do random screening and stuff like that. We've never had any knock on wood, but uh, I don't want to get it either. So anything coming back gets tested for that, and then they get tested later. So, um, you know, all that stuff kind of goes out the window when you go to a show. The good thing about a reptile show is that from my perspective as a vendor, I get to meet a lot of you guys face to face. I get to shake your hand. I get You get to see who I am as a real person, which these videos, I think, help with that too. Um, but I, I just want to reinforce the fact that who I am in real life is who I am on YouTube. That's the way that we try to be. You see me messing around with Rob and Jag and Jessica about never being on the videos and, and stuff like that. And that's just the way that we care about our animals and stuff. We're not overly concerned about our image or any of that. We're just a couple of regular people that really enjoy these animals and, and try to promote a culture and, and a climate where other people can too. That's the best part about reptile shows. I always say go to a reptile show to talk to the person behind the booth. Do your research. You can look at a sample of the animals and then figure out who the better breeders are. Ask them questions. See who cares about you, who, who seems like they're going to help you with customer support after the fact. And then support that person staying in the industry because it's a really difficult industry to be in. Look how breeders come and go so often because they don't get support. A lot of them don't have the YouTube channels with the awesome super chats and Patreon and stuff like that that we do. This stuff is a lot of work. It makes your face get paralyzed sometimes because you put in too much work and you're too hard on yourself fortunately i'm resting now except for this weekend when i'm going up to visit bar check in detroit because i'm not actually resting and it's, it's too much work all the time but that'll be a fun video for you guys to come out but meeting people like bar check me uh all the breeders that's why you go to a reptile show buying animals not so much it's a great place to learn about them i think yeah, impulse buys are you know Blah. Not the best way to buy a reptile anyway. Duran. Woohoo! You're late, Duran. Usually you're super chatting within the first, like, 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what does Duran want to He know? said, where can I get some of those shed tests? Shed tests? What shed tests are you talking about? Probably those snake size cards. No. no. These, are, these are not for Duran. I think you're thinking of something where you send a shed in and they they can tell you something about your animals. Um, this is a company, it's it's new, you won't find them anywhere. But it's uh, the product is called Snake Size and it's by Shed Gen is the company. And they are one of these companies that can take a DNA analysis of your animal. And this is preliminary, this is something that we are helping to contribute to the bloodline where they are going to look genetically at a range of different animals, so dwarf, super dwarf, whatever they are, they will give them all the information as far as, okay, it's 25 Kalatoa, 25 Jamp, whatever. But what they're looking for are the genetic indicators of size. If it's possible to do that, what this means is I can test sheds from animals as soon as they hatch, really probably before they hatch because you can take samples from within eggs, but um, we get the DNA of the snake, we'll be able to one day send them into them and they'll be able to project an adult size range. How awesome would that be? So it'd be really cool uh, for all breeders, I think really, this is something that much like dog breeds, you can certify, hey, my dog has good hips, hey, my dog has good ears. And they don't have the problems of purebreds or whatever. 
Snakes aren't really degenerate to that point. Most of them, there are a few morphs that have issues, but it would be really cool to be able to send out a certificate that says, I told you it'd stay under 10 feet, you know. So we're trying to, we're trying to do those. Uh, what they need people, if you guys are interested in that, they, uh, they're looking for people that have, it's just for reticulated pythons, and they want females that have bred at least twice. And uh, if you guys would like to contribute to the scientific study of what is controlling genetic size and reticulated pythons, and you have females that are twice proven breeders of any size, mainland down to Kira Superdor, let me know, and I'll get you a couple of these cards. You can fill them out and send them in. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, though. You'll have he to follow said, up. yeah, that one. Yeah, that's the one. So, you know, they're only taking samples right now to develop the tests to base, you know, uh, you know, get their test sample size so that they can figure out how to do that stuff. It's a little ways out because they're going to have to run all this stuff, process it, find where it is in the genetics. Then one day you'll be able to uh, send a baby shed in and they'll be able to tell, tell you how big it is, which should be pretty cool because the, the percentages thing, I mean, I'll probably always track all the lineages on all of our breedings anyways because I love that information but it can be bad for predicting adult size we're able to predict our adult size not because we know how to do math but because we know we're, we're intimately uh, familiar with the bloodlines that our animals are coming from and when we're where we're not we say I don't know you know what I mean so if it's a first time cross but one day it would be really neat to be able to genetically do that we have one more question about the shows, and then we've okay. got a couple minutes to our next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I think you answered part of this. Ben Taylor, how do you safely get all the animals to shows and take care of them? And uh, Do you have to look out for people walking off with them? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely. Th uh, thieves at reptile shows, unfortunately, are a really big problem. All of our enclosures are locked, so I have, like, metal cases the animals are in that are locked inside of metal. Um, and then they're displayed that way. I have keyed locks at night and stuff like that. If you're going to a good show, like anything put on by Brian Potter and, and Bob Ashley at NARBC, or if you go to the Reptile Super Shows by Rami, um, those guys have awesome security. So once everyone's out, you don't have to worry about it. Getting to the shows, um, you know, I have special cases that I carry my animals in. Uh, that are really just meant to keep them dry and keep them warm. Um, and we, we lock them in those. We get them to the shows. Then my display cases are actually temperature controlled as well. And like I said, I have uh, standard snake racks, the same ones we use in our baby racks here, that are lockable underneath. So, yeah, you really, you really should watch that. If you're asking because you're looking at going to maybe some smaller local shows... I would really look into getting some of the display cases. Like I know ARS makes some really cool ones. They're um, this kind of a plastic and they're illuminated and they're nice and they have locks and then they fold up. There's there's a plethora of different companies that that do different styles. I, I like the, the ARS ones. I think those guys are great, but there's a ton of them. Um, and getting those kinds of displays, you just get a couple of them. It's a great investment, guys. Uh, to be able to cover like an eight foot table and do that kind of a show. That's what I would recommend doing. Um, and then if it's a two day show, it's up to you. A lot of people, if you're, if you're set up well, you can just take those cases up to your hotel room with you or whatever. So you don't have to leave them there at night. Or like I said, if you're going to a real, uh, very professional show, then you don't have to worry about because the security will always be tight on that stuff. So Hey, I want to thank you guys for joining us that, this week. That's all the time that we have. We are going to jump over. What are we doing tonight? Or is, uh, it's the a live feed meeting. at the Breeders. Mm -hmm. So we have um, you know, a, an exclusive tier on Patreon, which are the we call them the breeder level. And we happen to also be showing you guys some stuff about breeding tonight because we've got some females that just had their pre-lay shed. We've got a bunch of stuff like that. So for those of you guys that are just getting started, it's kind of like a behind-the-scenes education on that stuff. Our, our slots are filled for that, but there's lots of other uh, spaces available on Patreon. We would love to see you guys there. We have a ton of behind-the-scenes content. It's a lot more intimate and stuff like that. But 
Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate you guys joining. I love just being able to hang here with you guys. And I know that I can't get to all of the comments there, but I promise I go through, I read them all myself afterwards. And so I just, I really appreciate these Wednesday nights hanging with you guys, especially after missing last week. So don't forget to like, subscribe, helps us out with the YouTube thing so that we can keep on doing what we're doing. We'll catch you guys next time. Uh, one more super chat. Uh-oh, super chat at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? Alex Rogers. Alex, what's up? So it was so awesome meeting you at Arlington last year. I was working Barb Clark's booth, and you came up and gave me a free shirt. Oh, uh, yeah. Awesome. What's up, dude? Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, you guys had some of the crazy uh, hybrid stuff we talked about there. Those burn balls, those were legit. So thank you very much. Uh, I mean, you're thanking me for the free shirt. I'm thanking you for the, uh, the awesome uh, sponsorship. You're like a sexy walking billboard. I love it. Appreciate it. <laughs> all right. We'll catch you guys next time. Thank you all.